How do I get the sound? She's muted. Hello and welcome everyone. We'll be starting in just a few seconds. Good afternoon. We're just letting in people on our Zoom. We're also on several other platforms as well for what promises to be a fabulous month with one of the gifts that is in our midst in Boca Raton. One of the wonderful things about working in a community like Boca Raton is that you get to know the people that are here who are scholars and lecturers and just part of the fabric of what the whole community looks like. And there's perhaps no better epitome of the breadth of just intelligence and majesty and politics and just interesting insight that resides then in Robert Watson. He is probably one of the most favorite lecturers Although he is home here in Boca Raton worldwide, literally, and he is a dear friend of Temple Bethel, and I am blessed to be able to call him when I need to ask a question or share an idea or a thought or a book or whatever, and also I'm lucky enough to see him when I'm at Lynn for Project Nuremberg, the amazing program that we do, and it is Project Nuremberg funds that allow us to do this month of learning with Dr. Watson because he's in great demand and very busy as a lecturer at Lynn. So we're thrilled to have him for the month. The only day of the Tuesday, the only Tuesday we do not have class is the Tuesday, the week of Thanksgiving. So we skip the 23rd. So there's no class November 23rd, but otherwise he is with us for the entire month. And the epitome of him is that he just ran here from a, a student voting drive, which is everything about him as a human being, as well as an academic and just a wonderful, wonderful lecturer. Robert Watson is an award-winning author, was published over 40 books and hundreds of scholarly articles and has essays in many, many documents. And some of his most recent books include Affairs of the State, The President's Wife, America's First, America's First Crisis, The Nazi Titanic, which is our topic today, and The Ghost Ship of Brooklyn. He is a frequent media commentator and he's been interviewed on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, USA Today, New York Times, BBC News, Hardball with Chris Matthews, The Daily Show, and many, many, many other uh, uh, sources out there. I'm going to put his whole bio in the chat so you have it. He's convened national conferences on the American presidency. He lives his love of history just in awe and threat. If you need to know anything about many presidents, but in particular Truman, he is the go-to guy. And because of this love in Truman, there's a unique and powerful, beautiful relationship with the state of Israel and his scholarship, because we know Truman was intrinsic to there being a state of Israel. And we were able to bring Truman's grandson a few years ago, thanks to Dr. Watson. He's a community leader and volunteer, he hosts countless registration, voter registration drives, mock elections. He is judge for History Day contests, and he has over 2,000 lectures. He has deliver, delivered to civic and professional groups, including Temple Bethel. He is the recipient of numerous awards for the civics program, for his contributions to the study of the presidency, and outstanding teaching awards. He has won at FAU and Lynn University. Where he served in both places. He was born, was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, attended the public school. He was a member of the football and track team, and he and his wife, Claudia, reside in Boca with their children, Alessandro and Isabella, and he is the professor of American Studies and director of Project Civitas at Lynn University and senior fellow of the Florida Joint Center for Citizenship. And Dr. Watson, it is a joy and a pleasure to have you with us for this month. Rabbi Jessica, thank you. Wow, that was quite an introduction. And uh, I would say two things. One, I'm blessed to count Rabbi Jessica as among my friends. And um, and two, now the pressure's on. I should have thought of something to say. <laughs> but um, I, I good to thank you for tuning in, everybody. I wish we were there in person. I have so many friends at Bethel. Uh, when I visited in the past, I think I literally know three quarters of the congregation and probably half are dear friends. So I look forward to that day when we can all reconvene. 
So I have a, a, a wild story for you uh, based on my book, The Nazi Titanic. And I, I'll preface it by saying the following. Uh, I guess my mantra I've said for all 30 years that I've been a professor and historian is that there's more about history we don't know than we do know. And history still has her secrets, including some whoppers. So when I started my career 30 years ago, I didn't want to be one of these historians or scholars who writes on just one person, one battle, one event, one decade. I wanted to write about everything that I thought was important. So I made a big list of all the books I wanted to write. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Harry Truman. I wanted to write about the revolution, the Civil War, World War II. But of course, the Holocaust was on my list. Um, and several years ago, this is about seven or eight years ago now, I was thinking about a book on World War II or the Holocaust, and I was chewing on the idea, what hasn't been written? And then it finally hit me, I was going to focus on the last week of the war in Europe and the last week of the Holocaust. So we're going to look at around April 30th to, through that first week in May. And that's a big, big topic. And how do you get your brain around the ending of the world's worst instance of genocide? How do you get your brain around? How do you do justice to the ending of the world's bloodiest conflict? 60 to 80 million people around the world died, you know, from September 1st, 1939 until May of 1945. And then I finally came up with an idea. I was going to start at April 30th, the day that Hitler committed suicide, took a cyanide pill, shot him in the, himself in the head, had his body burned in the Reich Garden, the, the trifecta, the hat trick, all three. I was going to start at April 30th and work my way forward to VE Day, uh, the surrender in Europe. So it'd be a little over a week. And I thought I would make each chapter a day. So I would take each day at the end, and I wanted to find one story of love and one story of loss. Maybe against all odds, uh, a couple lived through the Holocaust and reunited. Maybe a baby was born. Maybe there was a marriage. Maybe there, right? Who was the last person that we lost? So this is what the book was going to be, one dramatic story of love and loss. That way I could take this big, 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 big issue of the end of the Holocaust, the end of the war, and just bring it down to the most intimate and personal level of individual experiences. So that was going to be the book. Never wrote that book. Here's why. I was looking for stories and by dumb luck, and isn't that how science and, and uh, you know, new technologies and, and history work? By dumb luck. I, I stumbled across a letter from a major in the British Army. His name was Till. And Major Till said that of all the horrors of the war, nothing quite prepared him for watching thousands of Holocaust survivors die in the most unimaginable of ways as they were signing the surrender at the end of the war. So I thought, what is he talking about? So I'm someone that goes right to the source. So I called uh, the Holocaust Museum in DC. I contacted Yad Vashem. I contacted the Imperial War Museum in London, the World War II Museum in New Orleans, leading scholars. And I said, what was this horrific event that occurred at the very end? And everybody said it never happened. There was none. I said, I didn't think so, but I found this letter. So I went back to my original research, putting that letter aside, but it's still in the back of my head, saying, Robert, this is important. So I'm digging around doing research, and I come across another letter again, by dumb luck. This is from a general. His name was Mills Roberts. He's a general of the British Sixth Commando. That's a special forces unit like our 82nd Airborne Rangers, something of that effect. And General Mills Roberts says that he was there on the ground in North Germany on the southern Baltic shores and watched thousands and thousands and thousands of people die in the most gruesome, unimaginable way. Um, so now I had two letters. So I thought, okay, something happened. This is a very long story, but I'll make it. I'll give you the elevator pitch. I spent weeks contacting museums and archives around the world saying, what was this event? I couldn't find anything. My evidence suggested that this actually happened, but it was probably classified top secret which, you know, that happens, like in Nicolas Cage, right? National treasure, right? So um, I'm very frustrated having spent week after week after week calling the Imperial, you know, War Museum, calling the National Archives, calling the British Royal Archives, you know, having people hang up on me when they thought I was a crazy man by saying that they're sitting on the biggest story of the Holocaust and all that. 
Finally, I'm lecturing uh, in D-Day. Uh, I'm lecturing at Normandy in the landing beaches. I'm doing a talk for the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And I meet a woman there. She's an Academy Award-winning filmmaker from Hollywood. She did a film on the kinder transport and the Holocaust called Into the Arms of Strangers. Her name's Deborah Oppenheimer. I said, my gosh, I love your film. I show it to my students. Uh, she's also on the, was on the board of the U.S. Holocaust Museum. So um, as fate would have it, her parents, uh, her late father, Eric, and her mother, Gloria, the uh, Holocaust survivors, kinder transport survivors, it turns out that they lived in Boca, and they go went to all my weekly lectures at FAU when I used to be there. So I said, what a small world. And she said, you're the guy they went to hear. And I said, wait a minute, you're their daughter? You know, so I remember saying to Gloria, what kind of Jewish mother are you that you didn't tell me that your daughter won the Academy Award? You know, if my kid won the Academy Award, I'd have it on a T-shirt, right? Um, so Deborah says to me, tell me what you're working on. So my parents like your books. So I told her what I just told you. Uh, that there was this event, but I can't find out what it was. And she basically says to me, you know, I know Prince Charles. I know Dame Judi Dench. I know Lord Attenborough. Let me make a phone call. <laughs> I'm thinking, OK. Um, long story short, uh, two days later, I get a message from the, Ar the Royal Archives and all these top people in London saying, Debbie called. <laughs> she said, what can we do for you? She said, you're her bro, you know, her bud. Uh, so they, 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 I told them that there's, I think you're sitting on this giant story and I can't get access to the classified documents. They found it. It was real. There was a box of seven to 800 pages of classified documents about the Nazi Titanic. So uh, they declassified them, gave me first dibs, and I was able to write the book and go to probably a dozen Holocaust museums around the world, go to at least a dozen JCCs, at least two dozen uh, synagogues around the world sharing the story. I met with about 250 rabbis and Holocaust Museum directors in New York City to provide them with the information so that we can uh, share this story as Rabbi Jessica does with her Project Nuremberg and so many other wonderful programs from the BEMA that we can educate people about it. So if I properly baited you, are you interested? Here's the story. Okay. Thanks, Susan. So, okay, let's figure out the story. All right. So, here she is. There's the Nazi Titanic. So what happened at the end of World War I? Uh, Germany's fleet of ships was either sunk or captured by the victors, uh, commandeered. Uh, Germany loved ships. Uh, ships in Germany were kind of like cars in the U.S. in the 50s. You know, everybody was crazy about cars. Everybody was crazy about ships in Germany. So in 1927, um, Blum and Voss, it was one of the world's greatest shipbuilders, they're still in, in business. Basically, if you're a sheik in the Middle East and you want a yacht that's the size of the campus where I work, you go to Blum and Voss to build it. So they're the ones that build like Bill Gates's uh, boats. Um, so they decide they're going to build the world's greatest ship. It's going to be operated by Hamburg Sud, S-U-D. Whenever you cruise or travel to a port, you always still see Hamburg suit. It's one of the world's great shipping companies. So these two get together and they decide they're going to recreate, get this, the Titanic. Uh, so they study the Titanic and they build a new Titanic. And there you're looking at her. She's called the Cap, C-A-P, Arcona, A-R-C-O-N-A, -A, named for Cape Arcona on the Southern Baltic, Northern German coast. Uh, the only difference is she has three funnels that the, uh, the Titanic had four, but she looks like her. She's got the grand staircase, the chandeliers, the seven course dinners, the orchestra. Uh, there's a hot tub, believe it or not, pools, tennis courts. So they launched this ship. She's known as the Queen of the South Atlantic, the floating palace. She is uh, considered the finest ship afloat in the 20s and 30s. There's a poster for her. Look how sleek and modern. Um, if you look at her specs there, I put on the left side of your screen, she would be equivalent to the Queen Mary II today, or the finest uh, ocean uh, uh, cruise ships like a Crystal or an Oceana, only much, much, much bigger. Um, so she did over 90 transatlantic crossings, uh, typically from Germany down the European coast. Uh, and then she would go to Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. Uh, so there she is. Um, uh, here's some interior shots. That's a celebrity on the top center. 
um, monarchs from around Europe, Hollywood A-list actors, all the top actors sailed on her. So she was the ship uh, in, the, in the 30s. And you can see it looks just like the Titanic. Um, however, all that changes, of course, in 1933 and then again in 1939. In 1933, Hitler comes to power, and it turns out that Hitler loves big ships. He sees big ships as a symbol of Nazi power and Germany's superiority. He loves this ship in particular because it's the world's greatest ship. Hitler calls it the Nazi Titanic, thus the title of my book, the title of our lecture. Um, and Hitler tasks Joseph Goebbels his propaganda minister, with uh, making movies about this ship. The Nazis announced to the world, your Titanic sunk years ago, but ours is still afloat. We're superior, blah, 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 all that stuff. Uh, uh, tragically, A-list actors and European monarchs played right into Hitler's hands by sailing on the ship. They should have boycotted it. Um, so in 1939, September 1st, 1939, the Nazis with their blitzkrieg invasion hit Poland and World War II begins. Most German merchant ships, uh, you know, trawlers and so forth, uh, they are still sailing, but they camouflage them with paint and mount guns on them. Not the Nazi Titanic. Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler, Goring, Admiral Karl Dönitz, all the top Nazis, they don't want to lose their beloved ship. So on the left, you can see I marked it with a star. They put the ship on the northern Polish coast, the Pomeranian coast, in what is today Gdynia and Gdansk. Why that area? That would end up being about the last part of Europe hit during World War II, so they thought she'd be safe there. The Germans had changed the name of that port to Gottenhofen. Uh, today, Gdynia, Gdansk. On the right is a picture of her. They stripped all the fancy paint off of her. Uh, she's now rusting gunmetal gray to disguise her so she wouldn't be an inviting target. They took all the Persian carpets, the silk, this and that, the gold, the chandeliers, the priceless art off the ship. And she sits there from 1939 on as a floating naval training barracks for Hitler youth and young naval cadets. Um, now, in 1942, things change. Hitler tells Goebbels, in a rare moment of lucidity uh, from Hitler and Goebbels, they realize in 42 that they're going to lose this war. Remember, on all three fronts, thank goodness, the war went south. If you take North Africa, we kicked Rommel, the desert fox, Germany's best commander. We kicked them out of North Africa and defeat them in North Africa. On the eastern front, Hitler, in a moment of megalomania where he wouldn't listen to his generals, Hitler invades the Soviet Union. Operation Barbarossa, one of the world's largest military maneuvers, and the Nazis rush deep into Soviet territory. The cold winter kicks in, and entire units, entire battalions and regiments freeze to death, are captured, or die. So the whole Eastern Front goes, goes belly up, and the Germans lose hundreds of thousands of men, initially millions, ultimately. On the Western Front, the plan Operation Sea Lion is to invade England, the British Isles. But before Hitler invades, he wants to bomb England back to the Stone Ages. You know the story, the battle for Britain, as Winston Churchill called it. The German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, flies across the channel and is going to blow England back to the Stone Ages. Then the invasion comes. Against all odds, one of the world's greatest and most important upsets a few British pilots defeat the massive Luftwaffe and save the British Isles. So in the Southern, Eastern and Western fronts, all three go belly up. The wars change. So Hitler tells Goebbels, I need you as my propagandist to come up with a diabolical scheme, something enormous that's going to change the complexion of the war. You need to make the world love us, the Nazis, and hate the Allies. You need to imbue the German people with the sense that they're going to win this. So Goebbels asks, what is it I'm supposed to do that's going to change the war? Neither one knows. But they're thinking about what is going to be this, this you know, momentous thing that Goebbels does. And there you're looking at uh, the sick Joseph Goebbels in the middle of the screen. So the one thing Goebbels and Hitler do know something about is movies. They loved movies. 
Goebbels produced hundreds of Nazi propaganda films. Hitler and Goebbels on a weekend would get translators, interpreters, and it was not unusual for them, even though the war was going on, to spend a Saturday night watching three back to back to back Hollywood blockbusters in their entirety with translators. Then they would sit for hours and instead of discussing the war, they would discuss the cinematography, the acting. Hitler and Goebbels thought they were connoisseurs of fine film. They thought they were Germany's Siskel and Ebert, basically. Um, and thank you for knowing that reference because my students have no idea who Siskel and Ebert are. Um, in fact, they don't know who Goebbels is. Um, so um, there on, I put on the screen, Judd Seuss, uh, uh, Seuss the Jew and Der Vigor, Jude the Eternal Jew. These were two of Goebbels' most infamous propaganda films. All of his films had the same plot, as you can see from the covers. Um, uh, Jews were depicted as uh, devils, as satanic. In all the films, there would be an idyllic little German village, and then a Jew moved in. And lest you miss the obvious, rats would scurry around behind the character. It would get dark. There would be the foreboding, ominous build up crescendo of the music and bad things happen until the villagers with pitchforks and torches like in every Dracula movie drove the Jewish fellow out of town and then everybody lived happily ever after. So um, once when they were watching movies, uh, and of course the Hitler and Goebbels loved other propaganda films, you've all heard of Lenny Riefenstahl, Triumph of the Will, which was the most celebrated uh, propaganda film in history until the one we're going to talk about. Um, so uh, it, bottom right, cast of tens of thousands. Talk about Cecil B. DeMille, right? Ask, uh, this is what Goebbels, Hitler, uh, and Riefenstahl wanted, something so large that the emotions would be felt in the theater. So Hitler loves Riefenstahl's approach. He likes the Cecil B. DeMille type of films. He's upset with Goebbels, obviously ham-fisted, sophomoric propaganda films. So one day, they're watching movies. Hitler and Goebbels are watching movies. And uh, after the movies, uh, when they were sitting to debate the cinematography, Hitler and Goebbels watched one film that was so emotionally powerful that they couldn't debate the cinematography afterwards. Do you ever watch a film like A Schindler's List or Saving Private Ryan? When it's over, you just are sitting in your chair and you can't get up because it's so powerful. That's what happened to them. So they quietly watch the, the title, the, the credits run. And when they're watching the credits run, that's when Hitler had his realization. My gosh, all the directors, producers, actors, cinematographers, script writers, screenwriters, and engineers are all Jewish. And Goebbels wrote that he and Hitler kicked over all the chairs in the viewing room and were livid. But that's when Hitler had his epiphany and he announced two things to Goebbels. Number one, we're going to prove to Jewish Hollywood that we can make better movies, we the Nazis. So he tasked Goebbels with creating, get this, Hollywood on the Rhine, Babelsberg. They're going to challenge Jewish Hollywood to make better movies. Number two, he said, that's it. That's the answer that we're looking for to change the complexion of the war. You Goebbels are going to make the world's greatest propaganda film so powerful, so popular, that it's going to make the world love us and it's going to change them to give you a sense of how whack these guys are. Now, I put on the screen here three movies. Why? As best as I can tell, these were Hitler's three favorite movies. Yes, Gone with the Wind. Yes, King Kong. And from the file that you can't make this crap up, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, right? These are movies they watched all the time. The movie that Hitler and Goebbels hated was Casablanca. Right, everybody? Casablanca. Because it's basically an anti-Nazi film, right? Uh, with good acting, great cinematography. It's a great film. Um, but it's not an obvious anti-Nazi propaganda film because it's an action, drama, romance hybrid, as are all three here on the, on the screen. So Hitler says, that's it. We're going to make an action, drama, romance hybrid that people won't know it's a propaganda film, but the world will love us. So what type of film can they make? Here's a picture of Hitler during his regular movie watching sessions, which he was obsessed with. And we just rant for an hour afterwards about Jewish Hollywood after his films. 
Here he is with Goebbels watching an early take of his movie. So what movie is Goebbels going to make? Long before James Cameron figured out that the Titanic is an eternally fascinating topic, Goebbels and Hitler come up with the idea, we're going to make the German version of the Titanic. So we're going to make a movie about the Titanic, but it's going to be what? The Nazi Titanic, thus the name of our lecture, the name of the book. Um, now, as they make the Nazi Titanic film, they have a star for the movie. Don't they have an exact replica of the Titanic? Yeah. So it's sitting on the Baltic coast. So in 1942, they go to the Baltic coast, they repaint the ship, they clean her back up, they put all the chandeliers and gold and everything back in it, and they're going to film uh, their version of the Titanic. So Hitler, even though they're in a war, because of the importance of this project, he authorizes Goebbels to have basically an unlimited budget. So they, they hire the most handsome, handsome German matinee actors. They hire the most beautiful models and actresses. They assign the best set builders and engineers and carpenters and construction people. They even reassign entire units of the army, the Wehrmacht and the Navy, the Kriegsmarine, to be the cast of thousands, to be all the extras on board. And they start making this movie. The one problem they have, they have a star for the film, the ship, the Nazi Titanic. The problem they have is they can't find a director. They realize that all of Germany's great directors are what? In the concentration camps, because they're Jewish. So they look far and wide, and they find a guy named Herbert Selpin, S-E-L-P-I-N. That's him on the lower right with the sunglasses and the ascot, looking exactly like a movie director, right? Selpin was known as the hedgehog. He was diminutive in size. He was difficult. He was a diva, but he was brilliant. Um, uh, He's going to make the Nazi Titanic. On the lower left, there's the poster advertising the film he's making with a handsome German actor and a beautiful German model. On the top left is an actual scene uh, from the movie. Uh, in the top right is Selpine on set that you can see they're sinking. He's knee deep in water. That's him with the radio operator who's doing the SOS, which is a famous scene from all Titanic movies. So Selpine is going to make this movie. In some ways, Selpine is an odd choice because he's not a loyal Nazi. He's an artist and he's, he can't stand the Nazis. But in other ways, he's an ideal choice. Why? Because Selpine, he's kind of, um, he makes the action drama romance hybrids. I watched one of his movies, it's called Peterson. It was about a, um, a, a very handsome, dashing professor. And um, aren't they all? <laughs> And this professor goes to Africa, he fights the locals, he finds the treasure, and he gets the girl. It's basically Indiana Jones, you know, years before Spielberg's and George Lucas's brilliant movie. Um, so it's perfect. It's action drama romance, a dashing German guy, you know, the treasure and all that. So Selpine makes sense in that respect. He's going to make the movie. Now, fortunately for history, everything that could go wrong goes wrong. Um, the sailors that are the extras get drunk and destroy the set. One of the lead actresses gets pregnant from one of the sailors. There goes the movie. Uh, they're, uh, they're over budget. They're behind schedule. Hitler is breathing down Goebbels' neck. Where is my movie that's going to win the war? So Goebbels is breathing down Selpine's neck. Where is my movie? Selpine's drinking heavily. He's under stress. Uh, one day he shows up on set and everything goes wrong and Selpine loses it. He curses Hitler, curses Goebbels, curses the Nazi party, curses everyone. Well, you know, and I know, the SS and the Gestapo were everywhere. So Selpine is grabbed and dragged to Berlin to meet with uh, Joseph Goebbels. Selpine is hanged. Uh, and here's a picture from the box of classified documents. The Nazis kill him and hang him. They claim it was a suicide. Um, so there goes the director. Uh, not surprisingly, they had trouble finding a replacement director. Nobody wanted that gig. Uh, they finally found a guy that made B movies. His name was Werner Klingner. He finishes the film. So Goebbels is ready to watch his long awaited masterpiece. This is the movie, the Nazi Titanic, that's going to change the war. And he's going to watch it before he shows it to the Fuhrer. Goebbels watches it and he's aghast for two reasons. One, the symbolism. 
the movie's basically, it's a metaphor for Nazi Germany. It's about a fanatical captain, i.e. Hitler, who runs his ship into a, an iceberg, leads Germany into World War II, killing everybody on board, killing the German population. Secondly, Selpine puts propaganda in the film, but guess what? He peppers in a little subtle anti-Nazi propaganda. So from the grave, Selpine has the last laugh. So after all that, Goebbels, Goebbels orders that the film be destroyed. They destroy the copies of the film. Fortunately, copies made it out to Prague and Paris, and it still survives today. You can watch it with English subtitles. It is a brilliant film from a cinematography perspective, years ahead of its time. I mean, stunning, remarkable. But it's so difficult to watch because you know it's the actual Nazi Titanic and you know the purpose behind it. Here's the poster of the film that was supposed to come out, uh, which never did. Uh, now, uh, you all saw James Cameron's Titanic, right, everybody? Carol, you saw that one? Susan, Cheryl, Rabbi Jessica? Good. Everybody saw that one? Good. Yeah, me too. I thought Cameron was, you know, his film was brilliant, but I prefer the British film, A Night to Remember. Anybody remember that one? 1958. I know no one was alive back then. Rabbi Jessica and I weren't born until the 19, late 70s. Um, so um, uh, A Night to Remember is my favorite Titanic movie. Um, it, it, it's brilliant. And here's one of the reasons why. Get this. All the footage of the ship and the sinking, it's the actual footage from the German Nazi Titanic film. The director took all the footage. Why? Goebbels no longer had copyright. So you're looking at the sinking of the great film. This is an actual scene. That's the Nazi Titanic you're looking at. Here's another scene. That's the Nazi Titanic, the famous lifeboat scene. So if you watch A Night to Remember, it'll give you chills because those scenes are from the actual Nazi Titanic. So after all that, the film was destroyed, never went. So let's fast forward to the end of World War II and the end of the Holocaust. By March of 1945, we're at one of the world's most troubling months. Uh, and that was this. Hitler issues his notorious liquidation decree. Hitler notifies concentration camp commandant saying, if your camp has not yet been liquidated or liberated, I want you to destroy all evidence of the Holocaust. That means the camps, that means the paperwork, and that means the, the people in the camps. So it's, it's an, an absolute bloodbath that month. And historians, uh, we still don't know how many people were lost uh, in that month. So it's, it's horrific. Um, then Heinrich Himmler issues another decree the concentration camp commandants. And this one is bizarre. Uh, it's one of the most bizarre aspects of Nazi Germany. Himmler sends this cryptic decree saying, if your camp's not liquidated or liberated, I don't want the concentration camp prisoners to fall into allied hands. What does that mean? Does that mean kill everyone? Does that mean move everyone? Does that mean hide? What does it mean? We don't know. So some concentration camp commandants respond by moving everybody, others by killing everyone. Here's Heinrich Himmler's endgame. He wants thousands and thousands of Holocaust survivors to be marched or taken by train to the camp that you're looking at on the screen. That's KZ Neuengamme, N-E-U-E-N-G-A-M-M-E. -E -E. It's in Hamburg, Germany, north central Germany near the Baltic coast. It's a brick making uh, concentration camp where they also did some medical experiments with Jewish children on tuberculosis and diseases. So this is a notorious camp. Himmler, Heinrich Himmler wants thousands, tens of thousands of concentration camp survivors brought there. Why? He wants to then take them to the Baltic coast and he wants them all put on ships. What ship does Heinrich Himmler, Himmler requisition? to load up, of course, there's only one choice, the Nazi Titanic. So the, this famous ship is brought to the Baltic coast to uh, Lubeck Bay, L-U-B-E-K, uh, at the town of Neustadt, N-E-U, Stadt, New City, Neustadt. Um, so the, the Nazi Titanic is sailed to Neustadt. It's so big that it can't dock. It's bigger than a dock. 
So it has to drop anchor three kilometers out. And the whole end of March, in the month of April, into the beginning uh, of, of, of May, um, thousands and thousands of prisoners are sent there. And then they're put on board the ship. What does Himmler want to do? Why does he want to save all these concentration camp prisoners? Here's his end game. He wants to sail the ship to London. He wants to negotiate with Churchill or Truman or Eisenhower or Montgomery or someone. And he wants to make an exchange. I will give you tens of thousands of Holocaust prisoners in exchange for my life. Himmler's trying to save his own backside. Uh, as if, you know, the Allies would have taken a deal and saved him. Um, so we have this gruesome, macabre scene where thousands of people are being loaded on the ship. By the end of April, early May, there's thousands and thousands of people loaded on the ship, and thousands more concentration camp prisoners at the coast. No one knows what to do. The word arrives on April 30th that Hitler died in his bunker. Goebbels does the radio broadcast lying that Hitler was out bravely fighting on the front lines. No, he was a coward who killed himself in his bunker. You have thousands of people on the ship, thousands at the port. No one knows what to do. Um, then Himmler gets captured. Hermann Goring runs and gets captured. Joseph Goebbels commits suicide. Everybody's being you know, captured or committing suicide. So there's two Nazis at the coast. On the right, that's the SS Gestapo official. His name is Count George von Basewitz Bear, B-E-H-R. On the left, the guy talking to Hitler, uh, that's Karl Kaufmann, Karl and Kaufmann with the K and a K. He's basically the mayor or governor, if you will, of that region. Those two Nazis meet and they say, all of our command is dead or captured. What do we do? They said, we don't want to be responsible for the ship or all these people. So they came up with the plan. Let's put everybody on the ship. Let's fill the ship with fuel. And when we're forced to surrender, we will blow the ship up. Number one, we will deny the Allies from getting the Fuhrer's beloved Nazi Titanic. Number two, the world will forget about the Titanic because many, many thousands more will die on the Nazi Titanic. And number three, we're going to get rid of all those concentration camp survivors and one final mad unimaginable FU to the world. Um, so in early May, May 3rd, they're ready to blow the ship up because the British Sixth Commando, do you remember at the beginning, I told you the second letter I found was from General Mills Roberts, right? The British officer. The British Sixth Commando charges into the Baltic and they wipe out the Nazis in no time at all. Why? It's the commandos, special forces, against the Volkstrom. What's the Volkstrom? It's not the regular German military. It's a couple old men and little boys with old guns. The Volkstrom's wiped out. The British and the Scots seize the port. There's thousands on the ship, thousands at the port. Cheering erupts because people are saved. During the celebration, they hear a deafening roar. They look skyward, and out of the clouds come six squadrons of British bombers a deafening roar, the sky blackens. The bombers are Mark 1B Typhoon warplanes. You're looking at them here on the screen. There's one in a museum on the right. They're not small fighter planes, like an American Mustang or a British Spitfire, if anybody knows they're warplanes. They're not large bombers like a British Lancaster or an American B-17 or B-24. They're in between. They're hybrid. They can fight and bomb. They specialize in attacking trains, um, ships, and tanks. So these six squadrons are dispatched to blow up German shipping. Why? There's a rumor. The rumor is the Nazis are going to load up ships and flee to Norway. In Norway, they're going to use the geographic isolation, the snow, the mountains, and the fjords to dig in for one last redoubt, a final stand. And indeed, after the war, the Allies found Nazi subs, U-boats, in the deep fjords of Norway. So there was something to this rumor. So these six squadrons come flying into Neustadt as people were celebrating. And what do they do? They target the Nazi Titanic.
and they blow the ship up. It becomes the world's worst case of friendly fire. Thousands and thousands of concentration camp prisoners who survived Auschwitz, who survived the death march to Noyangama, who survived the death march and taken by train and cattle cars and, 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 and barges all the way to the coast, who survived days on board the ship are blown up by the Allies. The Typhoon bombers have three weapons they use. If you look underneath that one on the right, you can see there's a clip. They're carrying 500 pound bombs, which are massive. If you look at the rocket underneath it, that's six feet long. It's a 60 pound rocket. If you look on the wings of the ship, of the plane, can you see on the right there, there's twin cannons, twin big machine guns on the right. So these six squadrons, each squadron is supposed to have eight planes. So do the math. Um, uh, it's it's just devastating. They blow the ship out of the water, killing thousands and thousands instantly as the surrender was occurring. After the planes blow the ship up, the ship explodes in a fireball because it's filled with fuel. Um, people three kilometers away on the port are knocked over by the concussion blast. Uh, the ship starts rolling. Thousands fall into the water. The Baltic Sea is about 42 degrees Fahrenheit in May. So if you're reduced to skin and bones and you survived everything, people die of hypothermia instantly. As the ship is rolling over, it creates a suction and pulls more people underneath. If you manage to get a hold of something that floated and you're trying to kick away from the ship, these typhoon bombers came in and strafed with their machine guns the people in the water. The planes then flew over to the port. Thousands of people still wearing their striped Holocaust uniforms are at the port. The planes strafe the people at the port, killing thousands more. Um, one of the pilots whose documents were in that classified top secret box that I found, his name was Alan Weisse, W-Y-S-E. He said that we strafed the chaps in the water, killing hundreds, he said, then we strafed them at the port. He said, I was sawing, S-A-W, sawing torsos in half with my twin 20s on my wings. Um, one of the pilots was a Frenchman named Pierre Klosterman with a K. Klosterman was flying with the British as part of the freed French forces. Klosterman seemed to be the only pilot that I could tell that knew who he was killing. Everybody else, it was cloudy, it was rainy. It was a fog of war. They came in fast, fired everything, and flew away. Um, Klosterman says, quote, unquote, I didn't give a damn. He said, everyone that I knew died back in Paris. He said, this war has gone on long enough. He said, all my friends and, and, and other planes were blown out of the skies. He said, two days before this, he had an uh, artillery fire that blew flew the, through the tail of his plane it was a hole big enough to kick a soccer ball through. He said, I didn't give a damn. I was going to kill everyone and everything in the Baltic. He fired everything he had. Against all odds, a few people survived this tragedy of the Nazi Titanic. You're looking at Beric Jakubowicz. He and his brother, Jozek Jakubowicz, were teenage boys uh, from Poland, as the name would suggest. Um, they survived Auschwitz. They survived the death march and they survived days on board the ship. When the ship was hit, a gaping hole was torn into the ship and frigid water fills the deep holes. Barrick and Jozek are deep below in pitch black for days. Uh, they were living on top of feces and urine because there's nowhere for folks to relieve themselves. No food, no water, no light. Most folks in that deep hole have died. When the freezing cold water rushes in, most everybody that's still alive drowns. Barrick and Jozek are treading water below decks and they're floating up to the surface. Now, the problem is in the surface, the, um, the hatches are closed. So when they get up to the top, they know they're gonna drown. They take a deep breath and miraculously the hatches open. Some of the brave concentration camp survivors on the top deck, get this, rather than try to save themselves, went below decks save their comrades. They opened up the hatches and hands come down and pull Beric and Jozek out. They're running along the decks. Some decks are on fire. Others are flooded. They have to swim below. As I was reading the, the account, it's read exactly like the Poseidon Adventure. Remember that movie? Ernest Borgnine, everybody? 
Shelley Winters, right? Um, so uh, Barrick and Josek, the two brothers, make it on deck. The problem is the ship is rolling and the big funnels break off and they're crushing everybody on deck, the smokestack. So they start shimmying across the, 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 the hall, uh, moving to the bottom of the ship as she's rolling over on her side. The problem is with, with, with the engines on fire and all the fuel, it's so hot that it's burning people alive. So Barrick says, I'm going to go in the water. We've got to get in the water and try to swim the shore. Josek can't swim. So Josek says, I'm going to stay on, on the hull of the ship. They give their brotherly goodbyes. Barrick goes in the water. He shimmies down the anchor line. Um, he's picked up by a German fisherman who takes him to a bakery along with a handful of other Holocaust survivors. There's no food in the bakery, but they can wrap up. They're naked. They're freezing. They're starving. They can wrap up in the burlap sacks and light the ovens of the bakery to keep warm that night. Barrick asks the German fisherman his name. He will not give anyone his name because he's so afraid of the Nazis. I have tried for years to find his name so that I can contact Yad Vashem and ask that he be considered as among the righteous. Um, Barrick wakes up in the morning when the door to the bakery is kicked open. He thinks he's going to die. It's the British. They save him. They take Barrick to the hospital. Guess who he finds in the hospital? His brother, Jozak. The British went out the night before and found Jozak sitting on the hull of the ship as it rolls over. Jozak piled the dead corpses up and sat on top of them so he wouldn't burn to death. Barrick and Jozak are reunited. They move to Boston. They get good jobs, they marry, they have children, they live long lives north of Boston. I talked to Barrick's wife many years ago. Um, another survivor was Francis Akos, A-K-O-S. He was a gifted virtuoso on the violin, kind of an Itzhak Perlman uh, talent. He is the uh, violinist of the Budapest Jewish Symphony. As a kid, he's picked up, taken from camp to camp, survives the death march, survives days on board the ship. Francis Akos goes over into the water as well. He's picked up by Germans in a boat. They realize he's a survivor, so they throw him back in the Baltic. He swims three kilometers to the coast. Mind you, he hadn't eaten. He was down to skin and bones. It's freezing water. Michael Phelps could not swim three kilometers to the coast. When he gets to the coast, there's some Holocaust survivors lying on the beach. The uh, Hitler youth comes out of the woods and with the butts of their guns bashes in everyone's skull. So he swims back into the water. He's treading water. This is, this is superhuman. He finally comes to shore and is walking to the town naked and freezing. He hears behind him, he and a couple other survivors, hands up criminals. They turn around as a young German kid with a machine gun ready to shoot him. He thinks he's done. He hears gunfire. The kid crumbles to the ground. It's uh, General Mills Roberts, the letter I found, and the Sixth Commando. They save Francis Akos, take him to the hospital. He moves to Chicago, where he becomes the first chair violinist of the Chicago Symphony. He retires as the concertmaster. I spoke to him before his passing. He was in the stages of dementia. His daughter, Katie, was the concertmaster for the San Francisco Symphony at the time. So against all odds, some people managed to survive this crazy ordeal. There's a picture that the pilots took of the ship burning. That's the Nazi Titanic, a flame when it was attacked um, uh, on May 3rd, 1945 at 2.30 p.m. in that afternoon. Here she is. She rolls over. The Allies were so aghast that they ordered that all documents, all the pilots' reports, everything be confiscated and sealed top secret for 100 years. Fortunately, the Hollywood filmmaker used her leverage to help get the documents uh, uh, declassified. I had access so I could write the book and tell the story. And I, I'll end where I began. It just goes to show you that history still has her secrets. Um, I know uh, uh, Bethel does a remarkable job a truly remarkable job of Jewish education. I know your congregants, sharp crowd, well-traveled, but there's still secrets like this out there. So I'll end by simply saying that, so the words never forget and never again truly have meaning. We need to remind every generation 
because look at the backslide in the last couple of years of the resurgence of anti-Semitic hate and violence. It's been documented by the FBI, the ADL, the Southern Poverty Law Center, starting around 2016, an unprecedented spike in membership of KKK groups, neo-Nazis, the Proud Boys, QAnon, the Oath Takers, who all believe the Holocaust never happened. And uh, an instant, you know, microaggressions toward Jewish students, um, uh, the swastikas being painted on synagogues, Jewish cemeteries being desecrated, um, a remarkable, shocking uh, uptick. So we need to remind every generation and in honor of those that we've lost and in honor of the next generation, we all need to continue to do our research and dig and unveil and tell every solid, every Holocaust story, every single one of them, uh, so that the words uh, never again, never forget have, have meaning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Watson. I put in the chat and, and you have the ability to unmute um, if you have questions. I, I have two questions. We're waiting if others have questions. One is um, there was another, it's like this secretness and this hiding of things and not allowing access to documents. How do you as an academic deal with that? And I think there was, a, there was something, I don't know if you ever got permission or not, but I wrote a letter to someone to, to ha help you get access to something. I don't know if that ever, ever happened or not. And the second question is, what's happening with the Nazi Titanic today? I remember, is there a movie or, or something? What's going on with that? So, so. Uh, first off, thank you for the letter. Yes, a colleague and I are working on it. We were able to get access. Uh, we were able to hire a German scholar and a, a German archivist and an English archivist to go in the archives during COVID and dig around and, and send us the documents. We've I've secured funding. Uh, and we've hired translators and interpreters to do that. So some of the documents that I missed, some that were still hidden, uh, we've able to get access to them. So we're working on that project now to continue to dig and refine. Are, are you allowed to tell us about that project a little more or is it too early? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, we're, um, uh, we're trying to get to the root of, of, of Goebbels ordering the death of that filmmaker. We're trying to figure out who uh, it was that authorized Heinrich Himmler to do this mad scheme. We're trying to dig further to find out how exactly how many people were on the ship. We don't know. I estimate between 4,500 and 7,500 died, but also there were a couple of thousand on two neighboring ships, the Aten and the Deutschland. There were also a few thousand at the port and a few thousand on the death march. So when you add it up, I'm, I'm guessing at least 25,000 people died. Um, so that's what we're trying to find out, Rabbi Jessica. And we did get permission that we have the documents for we're working on it now. And the good news on the, the Nazi Titanic is um, the Discovery and Science channels, they're owned by the same company, are now, in fact, this weekend, I have to fly to Toronto, then I'm flying to London, we're filming. Oh. They're going to make a one hour made for TV documentary about it uh, that's supposed to air this summer. Uh, so Friday, I fly to Toronto and then to, to London. Um, so it's supposed to be out midsummer. Uh, the actual full length motion picture uh, there's still companies that are contacting me saying they're going to do it, but you know, I, I don't count my chickens until all the eggs are hatched. <laughs> but at least we did sign the contract. They have a screenwriter. They have a direct. Oh, the director's Israeli, by the way. So we have oh, a wow. screenwriter. We have a director. We have a production company, and the Discovery and Science Channel signed off. So I'm assuming that will go this summer. I have a son who's a young filmmaker who can write the other film about the killing of the filmmaker. When you're ready for that, he would Let love that. We, in fact, yeah. I have a friend of mine is, is about two thirds of the way done with the script. So uh, yeah, so we can put, send me an email. We'll put them in touch. All so, right, that'd be got. awesome. Uh, congratulations on the, please let us know when that special comes out sure. Um, for sure. Um, are, there, are there other questions? I'm just looking in the chat. Would you, okay, would you agree that some of the British bombers may have been anti-Semitic and really didn't care about the Jews and just wanted to get Nazis. Uh, no. Yeah, that's a rough question. Um, I've read the letters, the, 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 the reports, because when you're a pilot and you come back from your mission, all pilots are debriefed. There's, you know, they have to write everything down. There's that session. All that was sealed in, in the documents. I honestly believe that most of the pilots did not know who they were killing. Now, Rabbi Jessica and I know the difference between an, a German sailor and a half-starved concentration camp survivor in stripes. We know the difference between a warship and an ocean liner. But here's what happened. Number one, the, it was very cloudy that day. The clouds were at 2,000 feet. So the planes had to drop down below 2,000. 
Bombers don't want to go down but two, below 2,000 because they're susceptible to anti-aircraft fire. So they flew and quickly fired everything and just got out. Number two, it was raining, foggy, inclement, horrific weather. Nobody could see. It was pea soup. Number three, the rumor was that the ships were going to sail full of soldiers. When the pilots saw the ships, here's what they said. The Nazi Titanic was low in the water. That meant she was full of fuel and full of people. So they made the wrong assumption. And the final thing was um, the British and the Americans were running short on pilots. So they had fresh recruits between the ages of 18 and 22 were piloting mm -hmm. those planes, many of them on their second, third mission. The old man of the mission in charge of the six squadrons, his name was Johnny Baldwin. He was 23. Um, so if you put all that together, I think a lot of them didn't know. The one French pilot did know. But as I said, he said, I didn't give a damn. He was going to kill Jews, Nazis, ships, houses, civilians. Um, I, you, know, I, you know, I'm not at all for one moment excusing any of that. But I guess it's, it's warfare. Um, now you we think do about also the transference of information, you know, how like how the war was coming to an end, but who knew and who didn't and the slow moving nature of that. I, you, you want it makes you wonder how many errors existed in those. I can see why you want to write about the last week of the World War II because there, you know, you just look at the lives that were friendly lost. Friendly fire, friendly fire always occurs. There's always innocent losses of lives, and this does not excuse it. There was a huge snafu. There was a, a, a Swedish um, head of the Red Cross and nephew of the king named Count Folke Bernadotte. He two days before he went to the port and rescued um, a few hundred. Uh, survivors. He sent a report to the British saying this ship is filled with Holocaust survivors. He even gave the coordinates. Don't touch it. Yeah. So the British knew exactly where and who was on it. But the message was not transferred to the bomber and fighter commands that day. Some bureaucratic snafu we don't know. Having said all that, should the British have classified everything for 100 years? No. I think if there's a true national security secret, let's say, for example, Rabbi Jessica, let's say we had a, a covert operative deep in Iran monitoring their nuclear ambitions. That person's name can never be released or it'll undermine our mission and undermine that person's uh, safety. But something like this should have been released. The thinking, as best as I can tell, was no, at the end of this war in Holocaust, the last thing people needed to know was the Allies killed thousands and thousands of Holocaust survivors. So they classified it and it was locked away. And um, which is, you know, a, a yet another indictment of, of, of the British. To your last point, and then we need to end. Um, I, I mentioned this new book Daryl Horn wrote called People Love Dead Jews. And one of the things he talks about is how people don't value Jewish lives in the same way, and especially certain branches of Judaism and your last comment that like, you know, people knew, you know, who knew what and who cared to, you know, but the Holocaust wouldn't have happened if people cared about Jewish lives. So it's a bigger question. Um, I want to thank our awesome producer, Jake, who has just been front row seat to all these awesome uh, lectures that we have with you this month. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. There are those on YouTube and our live stream as well. Um, and we'll be back with you uh, next week. And just thank you, Dr. Watson. And we'll see you in a week from now. All right, so for your next lecture. I want to thank Cantor Jake. Again, thank my friend, Rabbi Jessica. It's, I was clicking through to look at some of the faces. I recognize a lot of you. So it's good to not just see foreheads, which is what I've seen for the last good 19 months. You know, good looking foreheads at Bethel. No <laughs> question about it. But um, I look forward to the next three lectures in the series. And I simply want to say to everybody, um, our, our Jewish heritage cruises are kicking back up in June. We're on the Danube with Uniworld, uh, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, doing a Jewish heritage cruise down the Danube. I've got I already picked out a dozen important, intriguing Jewish heritage sites to visit. I'll be lecturing about everyone. We'll be visiting them. That's this June. Then the following June, it'll be uh, 2023. It'll be the 75th anniversary of statehood. So we're taking an Oceana cruise uh, to Israel. Uh, wow. To, to Ashdod, oh. <laughs> right? and we're gonna you need a there. rabbi? We do, we <laughs> and do. a cantor. We do, we do. We're gonna, <laughs> rabbi Jessica, here's what we did. 
<laughs> I've been working. The Oceana gave us the preferred deal. We got to announce it before. We <laughs> so we're going there for the 75th. But since we're leaving from Athens, we're going to stop at Santorini, Mykonos, and Rhodes on the way to uh, Haifa. So, uh, anyways, so just send me an email, everybody, rwatson at lynn.edu. Or just call Lynn University and ask for me. I'll put that I look forward to seeing you next week, everybody. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank Jeff. you so much. Everybody Take care, now. everyone. Thank Be you. well. Thank you. Bye-bye.